On the 10th of April 1912, the ocean liner Titanic departed Southampton on her maiden voyage with 920 passengers on board. She was an Olympic class liner, around 883 feet in length with a gross tonnage of 46,328 tons and a capacity of around 3,500 passengers and crew. After leaving Southampton, she made her way across the channel to Cherbourg in France where another 274 passengers boarded. From there, she continued on to Queenstown in Ireland to allow the final 123 to embark. On the 11th of April, at around 1.30 in the afternoon, she weighed anchor and set off towards New York carrying around 2,224 passengers and crew. Most of the crossing was pretty uneventful with Titanic making good speed towards America. By the evening of the 14th of April, even the weather had cleared up and the ship enjoyed a clear and calm, albeit very cold evening. At 11.40 p.m., one of the lookouts spotted an iceberg right ahead, so he informed the bridge. Titanic went hard to port and set the engines full astern in an attempt to avoid the berg. Unfortunately, she didn't turn quick enough, so she made contact along her starboard side, ripping a hole right across her first five watertight compartments. In her ordinary seagoing condition, Titanic possessed a great deal of longitudinal stability. Her longitudinal centres of gravity and buoyancy lined up, keeping her level. If the bow pitched up, centre of buoyancy moved aft, creating a force to bring her back level and, of course, vice versa if the bow pitched down. For flotation, the magnitude of the buoyancy force created by her hull's displacement matched the magnitude of the weight force acting down. So, she would float and she would be level. When she hit the iceberg, however, the compartments that were breached could no longer contribute buoyancy towards keeping her afloat. Instead, that force needed to be generated by the other compartments, meaning she needed to sit lower in the water. Now, she did have watertight doors that could maintain buoyancy within those compartments. Theoretically, the loss of buoyancy on its own would have been survivable, but Titanic had the additional problem of a change in location of a longitudinal centre of buoyancy. It had moved aft. The new average location of buoyancy was somewhere around here. With the centre of gravity and centre of buoyancy no longer lined up, there was a moment created pushing the bow down. Now you already know that the result was that water would spill over the top of watertight bulkheads and lead to the ship's sinking. But did that need to be the case? Was there an alternative? Look carefully at this diagram and think about what's happening. The bow is sitting lower because of the separation between the centre of buoyancy and centre of gravity. So, to stop that happening, you need to find a way of lining them up again. One option would be to find additional buoyancy above the damaged sections. As those parts submerged, they would then start to contribute to the ship's overall buoyancy, dragging the centre of buoyancy forwards. All you'd need to do is eliminate the turning lever to allow the ship to stabilise. Unfortunately, in the case of Titanic, there was no additional buoyancy to be found, so before she could reach equilibrium, the next watertight compartment flooded. The longitudinal centre of buoyancy kept being pushed further aft, so the bow continued to sink. So, we know that there is no chance of relying on dragging the centre of buoyancy forwards, but what about the centre of gravity? Remember, equilibrium is all about lining up the force of buoyancy with the force of gravity. It doesn't matter where they are. What if... At the moment the ship's hull was breached, we were able to move the centre of gravity instead. If we could position it above the new centre of buoyancy, there would be no turning force and the ship would sink straight down, lower in the water, until the remaining hull contributed enough buoyancy to overcome its weight. She would have survived. So how could you move the centre of gravity? Well, one obvious way would be to chop off the forward end. Not only would the centre of gravity move aft, but the loss of so much weight would mean less buoyancy is needed overall. Maybe chopping off the bow is a little far-fetched, though from a purely mathematical point of view, it would have worked. Though that's a bit like saying the Titanic sank because the iceberg didn't do enough damage. So rather than chopping off the bow, the next option to consider is adding a load of ballast down aft to drag the centre of gravity towards the additional weight. The issue with adding ballast though is that you're increasing the overall weight and increasing the amount of buoyancy that's needed to float. If you ballasted enough to drag the centre of gravity back, chances are the ship would sink from all the additional weight anyway. So what about moving weight around instead? If there's ballast or swimming pools or coal or even bits of the iron hull up forwards, you could move it back. Move enough and you'll get the centre of gravity back far enough to keep the ship horizontal. 
Of course, the thing is you'd need to move so much weight around that realistically it's next to impossible. Although for all our ideas so far, the mathematics might work, we do also need to inject a sense of reality. Saying that, we can use our new knowledge to try and improve our chances. Remember I said that chopping off the bow would have worked? Well, that's not actually a bad idea. See, when a ship gets itself to the point where a collision is inevitable, very quickly you need to decide what part of the ship it's best to sacrifice. Nine times out of ten, the best part to sacrifice is your bow. You even have a bulkhead that's called the collision bulkhead. The idea is that head-on collision will cause immense damage forward of the collision bulkhead, but the remaining part of the ship would still have sufficient stability to remain afloat. Had Titanic rammed the iceberg head-on, the energy of the collision might have been absorbed by the damage to the forward hull, but astern of the damage, there may have been sufficient buoyancy to remain afloat. Not only that, but the iceberg would have conveniently disposed of a great deal of weight at the extreme forward end. It would have moved the ship's centre of gravity back for us. The part of the hull that remained would have probably had enough residual buoyancy to remain afloat, and the change in centre of gravity might even have let it float level. And that brings us to the end of today's video. Don't forget, we're on Patreon if you'd like to join our new community, discuss anything from these videos, or hear about what's going on in between uploads. Otherwise, we publish here on YouTube on the last Friday of every month. Until next time, thank you for watching, and goodbye.